And so we've arrived at chapter 28 in King Ahaz. He's in many ways the low point so far. Though the Davidic kingdom was nearly wiped out during the reign of Athaliah, Ahaz still manages to be described in uniquely negative ways by the chronicler. And so we'll begin here by looking at Lightheart's structure of this chapter. As you can see, it's very chiastic. And as Lightheart writes, exile is not on the horizon. It has come over the horizon and invaded Judah. It is an immediate danger, doubly so, as the structure of 28 to 5 emphasizes. So as you can see, B prime here is a chiasm within a chiasm, as it's going to show down here. But this chapter here is like a negative first fruits idea. They're getting a taste of exile. And so this is the lowest point we've reached so far in Chronicles. And similarly, John Stone is going to point out also a chiasm. He says, the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text, thus divides the chapter into two main sections, verses 1 through 15 and verses 16 through 27. These sections are chiastically arranged. Apostasy precipitates foreign invasion, verses 1 through 15. The experience of foreign invasion leads to still greater apostasy in verses 16 through 27. And so you have apostasy, invasion, invasion, apostasy. These sections again reflect Chronicles' sacramental view of life. Inner disposition and outer manifestation are one. Each mutually reinforces the other. We've talked about this before. The Chronicler has, I don't want to say a simplistic, but an idealized view of the world and version of events that he's telling. And so while the historical realities are very muddy, and you get that in Kings and Samuel, for instance, Chronicles tells it in this very idealized way where the bad people reap what they sow. It's kind of like the difference between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes or something like that. They're both wisdom books in the same Bible, but they tell two sides to the reality that we experience. And so for the chronicler, Ahaz's inward apostasy is only going to lead to outward manifestations of that corruption. And I do want to go ahead and look at Dillard here and his interaction with Williamson as something of a roadmap for this chapter. But first, a quick refresher. When Solomon died, the kingdom was turned over to Rehoboam. He attempted to consolidate the kingdom by traveling to the north to be recognized as king. However, this trip ended in disaster. When Rehoboam refused to lighten the burdens his father Solomon had placed on the northern tribes. In fact, he promised to increase the burdens. And this led to revolt, resulting in Rehoboam and Judah in the south and Jeroboam and Israel in the north. At the death of Rehoboam, his son Abijah took up the throne. And this is in chapter 13. And he led the armies of Judah against Israel. There, Abijah delivers something of a sermon against the armies of the north and charges them with apostasy under Jeroboam. And with this in mind, let's go ahead and look at what Williamson says, because what is going to note here is that the chronicler has taken the source material that he found in 2 Kings 16 and thereabouts. The way he's cast this material is as Williamson, or Dillard interacting with Williamson, as he puts it, a complete reversal of the relationship of North and South as found in 2 Chronicles 13. And so now it's the North, now it's Judah that's in apostasy. So first, like Jeroboam at the time of the schism, Ahaz too makes molten images for worship. He also worships the gods of Damascus, reflecting the charge of Abijah that Israel was worshiping the golden calves and them that are no gods. B. Ahaz shuts the doors of the temple, put out the lamps, and stopped the offerings of incense and sacrifices, and neglected the showbread. These additions to the chronicler's account amount to the negation of Abijah's boast of orthodoxy before Jeroboam. So he lists these things and says, you guys don't do these things. But now, as we can see, Judah is now neglecting these very things themselves. These changes show that apostasy in the south had reached the same depths as that in the north, at the time of the schism. See, at the time of the schism, the righteous left the north to join Judah, but during the reign of Ahaz, righteousness was found in the north. So we saw in that chapter that a righteous remnant from the north in Israel had defected over 
to Abijah and to Judah. And now, again, complete reversal. Whereas at the time of the schism, Judah was obedient to the word of a prophet regarding attacking the sister kingdom. Here it is Israel that heeds the admonition of a prophet. And this section is actually really interesting. We're not going to look at it in too much depth, but uh, it is worth noting that this particular narrative, many commentators actually think that this particular episode that we're going to get in this chapter, where Israel is acting in a righteous way, is actually the backdrop of the Good Samaritan parable that Jesus tells. But continuing with Dillard, D, the military fortunes of the two kingdoms are also reversed. Contrast the fortunes of Jeroboam with those of Ahaz. And so both talk about God delivering them into the hands of their enemies. At the time of Abijah, it was Israel that was subjugated, whereas at the time of Ahaz, it was Judah. Ahaz is the only king of Judah for whom the chronicler does not mention at least some redeeming feature. Ahaz is the antithesis of Abijah and the shadow of Jeroboam. And so let's go ahead and pick up with verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made metal images for the Baals. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burned his sons as an offering, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. A couple things worth mentioning here. Ahaz, his name is actually interesting. Johnston points out that Ahaz, his name, is the same as that of Ahaziah with the dropping of the suffix Yah, referring to the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel. In every respect, as the following narrative makes clear, this dropping of the name of the national god, Yahweh, and leaving a blank to be filled by other deities is an only too appropriate, if coincidental, commentary on the reign as a whole. And I do want to also note this language, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It's interesting here because this language right here, as Klein is pointing out, the chronicler employs the noun, that which was right, eight times to evaluate kings with the verb modified by not only in this passage. So generally we get the kings did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And usually it'll say, except they did these other things that were wrong. Here he doesn't get that exception at all. It's just completely negative. He did what was not right. So we're told of nothing that he actually did right. And as Dillard points out, in his handling of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the chronicler has abandoned the cyclical alternations between good and evil that characterized his accounts of the prior kings, preferring to portray them more uniformly as good or evil. In his account of these three reigns, the chronicler may have been seeking to duplicate the sequence of examples used by Ezekiel 18.5-18, such that Ahaz becomes the wicked son of a righteous man. And here we have a maybe, maybe not reference to human sacrifice. Superficially, it seems that way, but it's never quite so simple. And while we're here, let's go ahead and look at this chronology information, because last time we looked at Jotham, and he had this super short chapter. Johnstone took him as never having solo reign until had him reigning for about three years. And I'm just going to look at this highlighted portions for us here. Kind of as Till's conclusions, he says, so the years when Jotham was sole ruler began with the death of Azariah or Uzziah in 740 and continued to 735. From 735 to 732, Ahaz was in control, but Jotham was permitted to live. And part of where he gets the three years from is the Ammonites tribute. So we're told in these passages that they give tribute, but only for three years. So he says the fact that this continued for only three years would indicate that when Ahaz seized the power from Jotham in 735, Ammon again asserted its independence. And he also sees evidence in Aram 
and Israel's invasion. And so it's mentioned both in Ahaz's account as well as Jotham as a postscript to Jotham's account. He says that clearly points to an overlap between Jotham and Ahaz. If the attack had come when Jotham was in full control, it would have been reported only in the account of his reign. But the fact that it comes as a postscript to Jotham's account indicates that he was still alive when the attack was made. And the fact that it comes again in the record of Ahaz points to his being at the helm at that time. So there's good reason to believe that Jotham had a very short reign. And that information is not just a nuts and bolts issue, which of course it is on one level. But what we got from Jotham was mostly positive or basically was positive. And Ahaz is completely negative. And it would seem as though Ahaz somehow took control from his father. Maybe not an outright insurrection, but somehow he was able to gain control of the throne and immediately plunge Judah into apostasy. And we will move down to verse 5. Therefore the Lord his God gave him into the hand of the king of Syria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, killed 120,000 from Judah in one day, all of them men of valor, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, killed Maaseiah, the king's son, and Azrakam, the commander of the palace, and Elkanah, the next in authority to the king. In commenting on Pekah, specifically, Johnston says, the leader of the northern host, Pekah, is introduced for the first and only time in Chronicles. The fact that it is not even explained that he is the king of Israel, referred to in verse 5, suggests that Chronicles presupposes both for himself and for his readers the further information on him in 2 Kings 15 through 16 and Isaiah 7. So it's something we've encountered quite a bit with Chronicles. They just assume you know all this stuff. And it's also worth noting here that they forsook, which is key term language that we've seen pop up in Chronicles, but they forsook not just God, not just the Lord, but the Lord, the God of their fathers. So it's looping in David, it's looping in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's, it's bringing in all their ancestors. They've given up on all the promises that God has given to the people by forsaking God. And this is rather interesting here. In verse 7, we have this Zikri figure and the subsequent people that he killed. Johnstone writes, the three great Judean heroes of the day perish, three at the hand of but one warrior from the north. And he says, contrast this with First Chronicles 11, 22 through 23. And that's where Benaiah has these exploits, these heroic deeds where he kills a giant Egyptian and heroes of Moab and a lion, stuff like that. But now they're at the receiving end of this kind of uh, military success. But Johnstone continues here and he's pointing out that the all three bear programmatic and in the context, deeply ironical names. And so Zikri kills the handwork of the Lord as well as my help has arisen and God has acquired. The northern hero's name, Zikri, my remembering, bears an equally chilling message if the my refers to the Lord. And uh, Johnstone also continues in his commentary, commenting on these men. And he says, there's a frustrating lack of precision about the status of these Judean heroes. Maaseiah, the king's son, is presumably Ahaz's oldest son and heir apparent. Azrakam is called the leader of the house. If the reference is to the palace, he must be the highest state official. Indeed, he bears the old title Nagid, usually translated prince, of the kings of Israel, and might himself be the heir apparent. More sensationally, the title may be a shortened form of leader of the house of the Lord, in which case the reference is to the high priest. But he points out the name doesn't occur in the succession of high priests in First Chronicles 6, 
1 through 15. Indeed, none of these figures recurs elsewhere, but that list must be deficient. It does not include, for example, Uriah, the name of Ahaz's subsequent high priest. Elkanah is described as the king's second, either his immediate deputy, possibly on the field of battle, or more likely simply his second son. At all events, aside from the king himself, the status of these Judean heroes could not be higher. These are individuals who above all could be expected to vindicate the claims of the Davidic house on earth, members of the royal house, indeed, through whom the promises were to be perpetuated. And in this sense, it's very much like what you had with the death of Saul, where he dies and his three sons. And I remember Lightheart in his commentary noted that the four corners of his house fell on the same day, meaning his entire house, his kingdom collapsed all at once. And we have a similar kind of thing happening here, although we don't have Ahaz also being struck down in this battle. But it seems as though he may be a house that's standing up on one pillar. And moving down to verse 8, the men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves. Have you not sinned of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me, and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken. For the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. And let's go ahead and take a look at some of this. And Johnstone begins by noting here, that the lack of specification of adult males underlines the wholesale slaughter of Judah's army. The wealth, too, of Judah is looted. What had once been symbols of Judah's status as the agents of the Lord now become tokens of their forfeiture of that status. And the prophet's message is kind of interesting in light of some other passages, some parallel things. So Dillard writes, The Lord was using Israel as an instrument to punish Judah, but the Northerners had overstepped their bounds with excessive zeal for the task, zeal that now made them liable to divine anger. Compare a similar theme in Zechariah 1.15, Isaiah 10.15, and 42. And so you see this quite a bit, where God will use a nation to punish another nation, but they're still responsible for how they carry that out. As Dillard puts it, excessive zeal for the task. And Johnstone commenting as well, are they aware of what they are doing? Committing the archetypal sin of reducing the Lord's own people, God's chosen instruments of his purpose, their own kinspeople, to slavery, and of being the agents of an oppression from which they themselves have once been freed. So, of course, this is very ironic when you go all the way back to the Exodus, that you now have Israel reducing its own people in a very similar Egyptian-like manner. And down to verse 11, Johnson says, The urgency of the message is reinforced by a threefold play on words, Restore your exiled brothers whom you have exiled. And that would be a more literal translation, but as you can see here, if we were to use the ESV's word in here, it would be captives from your relatives whom you've taken captive. And the send back language is also kind of punning on that language as well. But moving down to verse 12, certain chiefs also of the men, he gives a little mini roll call, and they stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, you shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our guilt is already great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And when the men who had been mentioned by name rose and took the captives, and with the spoil they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink and anointed them, and carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys. And they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho, the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. Samaria. 
and a lot of key language here, sin and guilt and wrath. What is of note is here in verse 14, we have what's become a rare term, the hall, ecclesia. And Johnstone writes, they deposit the captives and the spoils in the presence of the leaders and of the community as a whole, notably called here by the sacral term kahal. There are occasions when the North, through its acknowledgement of theological principles, can still act as Israel. In Lightheart writing of this episode, he says, from the spoil they clothe naked women and children, put sandals on their feet, feed and give them water, anoint them with oil, seat the feeble on donkeys, and send them back to Jericho, the oasis city of Palms, the first city Israel conquered in the first conquest. Israel treats the captives of Judah not as slaves, but as brothers and sisters, generous even to the least of these. The echoes of this passage in the judgment scene in Matthew 25 are not accidental. And now verses 16 and following, at that time, King Ahaz sent to the king of Assyria for help. For the Edomites had again invaded and defeated Judah and carried away captives. And the Philistines had made raids on the cities in the Shephelah and the Negeb of Judah, and had taken Beth Shemesh, Ajalon, Jedaroth, Soko with its villages, Timnah with its villages, and Gimzo with its villages. And they settled there. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, the king of Israel. For he had made Judah act sinfully and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. And so the king of Assyria came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. For Ahaz took a portion from the house of the Lord and the house of the king and of the princes and gave tribute to the king of Assyria, but it did not help him. And Johnstone says, Chronicles now portrays the extremity of Judah's situation. Ahaz is under threat from all sides, not just from the Syrians to the northeast and Ephraim to the north, but also from Edom to the south and the Philistines to the west. And also, again, the Philistines. Johnson says that they, the Philistines, also sense Judean weakness and launch raids. And he again points to a potential pun on the word Philistine and raid. But as Johnstone says, in point of fact, this is the last occasion on which the Philistines appear in Chronicles. The territories that Uzziah had conquered in the lowlands and beyond are lost to Judah. A whole string of cities down to the eastern limits of the lowlands with daughter villages is listed. And while some of these places are semi-obscure, Beth Shemesh and Ajalon are Levitical cities. We'll go ahead and take a look at Lightheart. He says, usually the chronicler punningly contrasts sacrilege with exaltation. And we've come across a number of these. He's highly exalted and stuff like that. With Ahaz, the latter modifies the former. Ahaz is superlatively unfaithful. His sacrilege towers to the skies. And so he's referring to the fact that we now have the Ma'al language show up here, but this very, usually they're very strong or something to that effect. But Ahaz is just so terrible, he's very unfaithful. And Johnstone says, Chronicles therefore adds his fundamental category. Ahaz has been found guilty of gross ma'al. As verses 1 through 5 have expounded, he has broken all bounds of restraint in Judah. And he points to here a potential pun. His willful violation of the Lord's claims to soul deity brings with it forfeiture of his status as the Lord's representative and of Israel's status as the Lord's host on earth. That is why Judah is beset on every side by the nations of the earth. And this becomes kind of deeply ironic here that he goes to the king of Assyria for help. So as Johnson says, the folly of appealing for help to the Assyrian king now rebounds on Ahaz. His supposed helper is going to plunder him. As he points out here, he afflicted him instead of strengthening him. And the strengthening is one of our key terms. Usually it's God that is doing the strengthening when they're faithful. But here, he did not strengthen him. He did not help him. As Johnstone says, a bitter play on the standard verb of the Davidic king being established in his position. And so he lays siege to Jerusalem 
he is bought off in verse 21 only at the cost of Ahaz's stripping bearer. So the meaning and context of the verb HLQ in the usual sense is to divide the treasuries of temple, palace, and even of his chief officers. There may be another play on words intended between HZQ and HLQ. And so he's referring to these two terms, right? The stripping a portion away and the strengthening. So perhaps some kind of pun going on there. Spoils and tribute the symbols of recognition of Israel by the nations of the world in virtue of its status as the Lord's host on earth have now been handed over to Assyria in recognition of its temporal sovereignty over it. He was of no help to him. Chronicles adds tersely, using again the key term, this help language. Of course, he is of no help. But what is Ahaz to do now that everything has fallen apart? Verse 22, in the time of his distress, he became yet more faithless to the Lord, this same King Ahaz, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, because the gods of the kings of Syria have helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and all of Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking to anger the Lord, the God of his fathers. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways from first to last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. And so rather than turning to the Lord for help, he just doubles down on his apostasy. And Dillard points out in his commentary, it used to be believed, or at least theorized, that perhaps Assyria imposed worship on its vassal kingdoms, but other scholars have concluded that the Assyrians didn't impose worship of their deities on vassal states. So this is actually just completely Ahaz's own doing. He's not being forced to do this. He's doing this by his own will, and that the apostasy under Ahaz reflects indigenous Canaanite cults, as the text of both Kings and Chronicles suggest, rather than specifically Assyrian worship. So he resorts back to the previous Canaanite worship. The chronicler is perfecting the parallel between the apostasy of Judah under Ahaz and the apostasy of Israel at the time of the schism, just as Israel worshipped idols and those that were not gods. So too Ahaz leads Judah into idolatry. And this is kind of interesting, this line that they were the ruin of him in all of Israel. So as I point out here, the form of this word ruin is only used four times in Chronicles, twice in Second Chronicles 25.8, and once in 28.15, and here in verse 23. The reference to 25.8 is when the prophet is urging the king to send back the northern army. This is when Amaziah has hired the Israel mercenaries, and is told to send them back. And the prophet says here in verse 8, Why should you suppose that God will cast you down before the enemy, or make you stumble before the enemy? For God has the power to help or to cast down. And again, note here, we're dealing with help language. So he's he can help or he can cast you down. And these are two of the four uses are here. And what's interesting is one of the other uses of course, is here this ruin language, but it also is used of the feeble that were clothed by the north. Think of it like they're they're too old, and so they're kind of like stumbling around. They're too old to walk, so they're put on donkeys. And so it's this positive action here by the north. But given that this is such an important theme, the relying, or rather relying on God instead of relying on the other nations, instead of relying on your alliances with foreign powers. And that's exactly what the prophet in 25.8 is urging the king, is telling Amaziah to rely on God, not on 
the Israelite forces. And here we have Ahaz, who is not just relying on the other nations, which he does, but he's also relying on the other nations' deities, on their gods, resorting to them for help. And of course, it's the ruin of him. But let's take a look at Lightheart. He says, Ahaz does not turn to Yahweh for help. He abandons Yahweh, and so the Lord forsakes Judah. Even at this late date, he could humble himself and seek Yahweh, but he refuses voluntary humility and so suffers the involuntary variety. Floundering, Ahaz turns to the gods of the Arameans, who have proven themselves powerful by subduing Judah and apparently Yahweh. He closes the temple, and in place of the one altar in the temple, he builds altars at the corners of Jerusalem, turning the chosen city of Yahweh into a single altar platform for the gods of Damascus. Yahweh has an open-door policy, welcoming his people into his house, ready to hear their prayers and receive their sacrifices of smoke and song. Under Ahaz, the temple shuts down and falls silent, and lamps go dark. It is a sign of things to come. And so it's a foreshadowing of the looming exile, the great exile that's coming. But that is Ahaz and chapter 28, perhaps the lowest low that we've seen of Judah so far. But Hezekiah is right around the corner. He's given, I think, the third most attention of any of the kings. And so things are largely going to rebound. But again, this is just going to be a brief interlude to the looming exile that's on the horizon. But we'll pick that up next time.